Every year when summer comes round, off to the sea I go. I don't care if I do spend a pound, I'm rather rash, I know. See me dressed like all the sports, in my blazer and a pair of shorts, with me little stick of black bull rock. Along the promenade I stroll. It may be sticky, but I never complain. It's nice to have a nibble at it now and again. Every day, wherever I stray, the kids all round me flock. One afternoon, the band conductor up on this stand somehow lost his bat and it flew out of his hand. So I jumped in this place and then conducted the band with my little stick of black boo. The concept I wish to present is to create a visitor centre attraction north of Ginn Square. A great deal of money has been invested over the last decade in updating accommodation in Blackpool. A lot of that money has been wasted because it's gone to Central and South Shore where a lot of the properties have either been sold on, ceased trading or are now outside the holiday zone. Very little has been invested in North Shore. And I think, amongst others, it is time we tackled this problem head on. Looking at the sub-area options of the holiday area in North Shore, option one is to do nothing. Option two is to improve the holiday zone by protecting us from change of use and focusing public investment in the businesses and the environment. Blackpool Council has now announced the proposed holiday zone area. So we no longer can criticise them for that. We've actually got the answers we wanted. Our problem is what are we going to create? And we're proposing King Edward Avenue Seaside Heritage Walk. As a destination tourist attraction, a heritage street with interactive displays, heritage boarding house attraction and a heritage street lighting and illuminations. Most properties here, as you can see from our street uh, posters, were built between the turn of the 20th century and up to the Second World War. These properties were deemed to be large, desirable houses. And it wasn't until the 1930s that many became adapted to cope with the influx of holiday makers. These were adapted either to holiday flats or to bed and breakfast or small hotels. The advantage this avenue has, it does have its own off-street parking, which is a great asset, I can assure you. However, the area has been unable to benefit from the regeneration programs offered around Blackpool. Nothing has come this way yet. We have a problem. King Edward Avenue can easily be eclipsed in the holiday industry in Blackpool unless something is done to invest in it and bring people north of Ginn Square. If nothing is done, if option one is, is accepted and nothing is done in the area, despite being in this protected area zone now, holidays, we end up being feeling isolated we're on our own, having to row our own canoe. We feel undervalued and demoralised. We see money going always to the south. We have to do everything ourselves up here. And it cannot continue, it is as simple as that. Our only other option now is just to cease trading, which will do Blackpool absolutely no good at all. It wouldn't harm us because we've still got our homes. Now, the immediate reaction is going to be, don't you know there's a recession on? My answer is yes. But what better time to invest in the future than during a recession? I fortunately, or unfortunately, lived through the last two recessions in this country. And I'm extremely dismayed, because I worked in industry at the time, that the lack of investment left this country bereft 
of basic skills. We now have to import them from Poland and Spain and Portugal and anywhere else we can find a, train, a trained craftsman. We lost them due to lack of investment, lack of investment in training. The hospitality industry, we lost. How often do you go out to a restaurant and find no one cares? It's a canteen. You get a tray that end, you go along and you come off the other end, you pay the till, that's it. There's no silver service. When did you last go into a restaurant where you had a linen napkin? The service industry in Blackpool, and not just Blackpool, across the country, failed miserably in the last recession by not investing in training, not investing to bring people into this area in particular, and it's desperately needed. I hope, and particularly hope that Blackpool has learned lessons from the last recession. It is so easy for option one. Now Blackpool has been recognised as starting the seaside holiday resort idea in this country. The reference is going back to the 18th century. There's certainly a lot of interest in Blackpool, but there's nowhere of interest in the town where you can see the history of Blackpool and the evolution of its main industry, which is tourism. There's no one place to see that. I believe that King Edward Avenue should be that place to enshrine Blackpool's history and evolution in one place as a holiday destination, as a visitor attraction. It's extremely important for us. This, this is what we do. King Edward Avenue itself should be diversifying at this stage into a heritage and cultural centre. It has every opportunity here to do it. We have the opportunity, we all, most of us have off-street car parking. If we made uh, a one-way system here, you'd end up being able to park more cars here. Parking would not be a problem. Which most other areas in Blackpool, it would be. So one up to King Edward Avenue, if you like. What is proposed is a walk through time Created, do it in many ways, but the obvious way is an ever-changing street scene. Uh, for example, here, we have the boards outside each property. Ever-changing, going from one end of our history to the other. In the first sense, but it's not to be static. It will change continuously. If you, for example, you have a forces week in Blackpool, they would represent Blackpool's contribution to the war effort over two world wars and don't forget the current conflicts where men and women from this area are giving their lives for the country. Blackboard has a unique advantage there that we actually celebrate it. There are lots of other activities that go on in Blackpool that, that could be used for. So it's not just going down seeing a picture of that, a picture of that and a picture of that and it stays the same year after year. It isn't. It's forever changing, ever growing. Let's take a look at accommodation. What was it like when it started? Late Victorian, when the bed and breakfast industry really took off. Can you imagine going into one of those B&Bs or hotels? Large terraced houses. As you walked in here today, sweet smelling either with flowers or sprays or whatever, go into those, you smelt burning coal, soot, stale urine. That was what it was like. Remember, everything was very basic. No central heating, no indoor sanitation. The bedrooms, five to six to a bed, five or six beds to a room. A chamber pot, either under one of the beds or in a bedside cupboard, that was your toilet. A jug, a basin, and what we would call a slop pail, that was your ensuite. You had the water to have a wash and shave and put into the pail to <coughs> carry downstairs and empty it. Nowadays, everyone wants a sea view. They certainly had one in those days. If you could see out the window, that is, through the grime, you had a view of smoking chimneys, of soot everywhere in the area, and of course, the whole of the promenade covered in drying sheets all along the sea defences. The back alleys would have been full 
of sheets drying. We had no tumble dryers. All the washing had to be done by hand. The cleaning was a broom. We didn't have vacuum cleaners. So if it was a posh place, of course, all the slop pans, because under the bed and everything else, all matched, only if it was posh. In most homes, <coughs> this was quite normal, but it certainly wouldn't be accepted today, and I hope it doesn't happen. Now, who operated these premises? Well, strangely enough, they were usually single women. Some were married, but their husbands worked away. You had divorcees, not many in those days, I know. But you had women that had been abandoned by their husbands. Or you had spinsters. And just look, they were a ferocious breed. And they had to be. They had to be tough. They worked on average 19 hours a day, washing and cleaning and preparing food under terrible conditions, as we would consider today. To them, it was a normal working way of doing things. Help, if they could afford servants, there were very few. And like the hospitality in general, people working in the hospitality industry work very long hours, very little money, and it is hard work. The only relief came, if you like, at Easter time. The kids were taken out of school and didn't go back until the end of the season. Their summer break, was a very long summer break, was working in the hotel. Many guests were banned from using the house from breakfast time until dinner time. They were out. That was it. You weren't coming back. The rules of these houses and these were very strict. And they had to be. However, guests did, with luck, have a parlour. Typically Victorian, overfurnished, and of course the coal dust invading everything they touched. It was just part of a way of life. If they were lucky, they had a piano in the room. Not bad. So, uh, home entertainment. I can remember the days when that was the only entertainment you had, a piano and a sing-song. Not just at home, but around the local pub as well. That was it. Strict rules applied when it came to closing the house up. If it was 10 or 11 o'clock at night, the house was locked. No such thing as late teas, I'm afraid. That didn't happen. Never allowed. And to help keep the profits up, if you like, or to make money, there were additional charges for use of the cruet. Now, I went to a jeweler's not long ago and asked the young lady if she had any silver cruets. And she shouted across the room, Mabel, what's a cruet? Different world. Sauce bottles were charged for. Hot water was charged for. I can imagine I'm not paying for that today. Now, the actual history of Blackpool is far too long for me to go through in a short presentation. However, the evolution of the B&B, &B, as you can see from the uh, poster in the corner, does show quite clearly how we have evolved over the last 50 to 100 years with the services that are on offer. The walk through time with additional street lighting is the first part of the concept. The second part is to purchase a property on the avenue and adapt it into a heritage centre. Each bedroom representing a different decade on the evolution and what is expected. There would obviously be the usual things like a Victorian tea room and cells of other things to hopefully cover the running costs. Uh, the advantage of purchasing the property from an accounting point of view, you're in a win-win situation because you run it as a business. If the income doesn't cover it from entrance fees and sales of uh, goods from the premises, at least the property will continue to increase in value. Despite what the current recession is doing, property will increase in value. Now, from the very end of the Victorian period in 1901, I was going to say 1900, but I knew someone would correct me, only the basic accommodation was available. Some had electric lights. The majority either had gas lamps, candles, or oil lamps. Another odious odour to contend with as you walk into a building. Nothing very fresh in those days. Skip forward to the 20s and there was a vast improvement. We had won World War I, but unfortunately the working people were still having to pay for it. 
but they demanded more for their money, and they got it. On to the war years in the 1940s, of course, uh, a lot of the bed and breakfasts and small hotels were commandeered by the military to house uh, service personnel. Rationing was in full force, and the landlady had to acquire all the rationing coupons to feed their guests during their stay. Not easy, because they also had to keep everyone's spirits up. So much loss of life, so much destruction all around them. They were the pivotal person there to make everything work and the holidays to go smoothly. It was an undervalued way of life, but they did it and did it extremely well. But by the 1960s, Britain was back into a boom period. Unfortunately for Blackpool and places like seaside areas, so was the cheap flight to Spain. And by going to, shall we say, more modern holiday resorts, it was fresh accommodation, purposely built. So they all had en suite, they all had the extra services that we have fought so hard to adapt in our own premises. It was very difficult to change that. And it would have been easier if hotels and hoteliers had worked and the investment people had worked together then because we found the hoteliers lagging behind through lack of investment, <coughs> be it their own personal investment or investment by government and the other agencies. I'm not blaming any one government for this. This is across the board, lack of investment. They also had more adventurous food and drink was cheap. One of the British problems, I'm afraid, is the drinking side. The 1980s proved many accommodation providers that had not invested were finding business tough. We were back into recession. They had not taken the advantage of keeping up with the times. By 2010, most properties had made some effort. Those that have not have only themselves to blame, but at the end of this recession, their businesses have failed. They haven't got it right through lack of their own training and lack of investment or lack of asking for help to get it right. I think this is extremely important. People don't ask for help. By investing in a heritage site now, the result will show how it's evolved and how its forward-thinking attitude does pay off to make this a unique attraction. And I say unique, understanding the meaning of the word. There is nowhere else in this country that has this facility that can show in one place the whole evolution of the hospitality industry and the history of Blackpool that would go with it. We would have to work with various partnerships, but in particular with Blackpool College, from arts and drama to the media sections, to work with us. Should we have a tea room, we want people in costume. We want the art students to come up with posters, these changing boards. What a wonderful way for them to get the experience for their art degrees, to pass their exams, to become involved. I will go over at the end a few of the agencies we need, or we feel we need, we're here to ask for help uh, and input. Audio in particular, each bedroom, as we, we, we go through, would have an interactive audio, so people can plug in their own earphones and listen to what went on in those days. You would see how it was furnished and how things changed through the years. The resulting income from tea rooms, etc., would help fund the enterprise. Costings are important, and rather than me give out loads of facts and figures that will go over my head and everybody else's, not necessarily, but uh, there is a complete business plan and breakdown of finances in the pack ready for you to take away. Now, remember, this is in three stages. The lighting from the promenade, the changing display boards, and of course the heritage site. Each can be achieved individually or as a total package. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we seek your advice and support in turning this concept into a reality. Above all, we do need to see investment 
in the hidden treasure of Blackpool, which is North Shore. We will hopefully work with people like the Heritage Lottery Fund, Re Blackpool, the Arts Council, English Heritage, Blackpool Illuminations, the museums and libraries, to make what would be a unique visitor attraction to North Shore and to Blackpool. I am sure you'll find it very worthy of this town to go forward and show the world we can invest. We are not shy of putting money where the ideas are and make them work. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you.